Hello guys, um, a warm welcome to the attendees. Um, I'm very uh, happy to present the panel today. And um, I would like Andrea to um, start her camera. Yeah, there we go. Um, and uh, you may introduce yourself to the audience. Um, and I'm very looking forward to your talks. Thank you very much. Andrea, you have to unmute yourself. You're still muted. Yes. Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So welcome, everyone. This is our final day of the Psychology of Global Crisis. This has been a fantastic conference around the world. And I'm very glad to chair the panel here, the Panel 20, Solidarity, Accessibility and Self. And I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker here, that's Dr. Evelyn G. Lindner. And she has a fantastic bio here, but I have to, because of time, I have to summarize here. She has been a, she has a dual education as a medical doctor and a psychologist with a PhD in medicine and a PhD in psychology. She's the founding president of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies, a global community of concerned academic practitioners who wish to promote the dignity around the world. Dr. Lindner is also co-founder of the World Dignity Universe Initiative, including the publishing house Dignity Press. All initiatives are not for profitable labors of love based on the practice of direct solidarity and gift economy. Uh, Dr. Lindner uh, lives and teaches globally and is affiliated among many universities. Uh, she's been uh, nominated for the Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize in 2015, 2016, and 2017, and gave all network members great courage. If you wish to receive copies of her publishing, please contact her. So with no further ado, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Linda as a first presenter. Please, you can share now your... Um... Thank you so very much. Thank you, Andrea, for this uh, lovely introduction. I would like to start with um, uh, sharing with you that I have given this talk also uh, a longer version of it, one hour, and you can find the link on the website humiliationstudies.org and you see my email address at the bottom here. And um, I would like to, to share with you that I give a lot of talks and popular and academic. There is the whole range and please be prepared that I will go the middle way with you now and I will be extremely short and jump over most of it due to the time limits we have. First, thank you so much for having me and everybody who is here for being here with me. What are the guiding questions of my work? Where do we come from, we as humankind? Where are we now and where can we go if we wish for a dignified future? My short answer, we have dug ourselves into a multitude of perilous crises, both despite and because of what we call progress. We engage in systemic humiliation, ecocide and sociocide. We shred our relations with our habitat and with each other. We degrade our sociosphere and our cogitosphere, our sphere of thinking and reflection to the point that we sacrifice our ecosphere and thus embark on our collective suicide as a species. At the same time, there's also an immense window of opportunity waiting for us to use. Unfortunately, so far, instead of recognizing the depth of the crises we are in and grasping the historic opportunity to ex exit, it seems that most of us choose to stay short-sighted and myopic. My hope, Perhaps we need a crisis that is big enough to urge us to use existing windows of opportunity in earnest. What about the coronavirus pandemic despite the suffering it causes? Before I continue, I would like to apologize that I do not always look at you because when I read, I look a little bit down. Now I would like to just 
quickly touch upon the choice of tools for analysis and modeling that I use. Social psychology is at the core because it is positioned in the middle of micro and macro levels of analysis and modeling and thus offers access to full transdisciplinarity up and down. Then big history shapes emotions and meta emotions or how we man manifest emotions. So history is very important. The philosophy of mind that I use is non-dualism and unity in diversity. And it can be manifested through, among others, Max Weber's ideal type approach or subsidiarity. The philosophical approach to understanding science that I use is critical realism. The methodologies that I use, transdisciplinary approaches, at the core is personal consistency through walking the talk of dignity in all spheres of my personal and academic life through what I call global life design, entailing autoethnography and very important independence from national and corporate funding and interests, which means that I have to be based on gift economy. I will now jump over the next slides. It just, to, this is the flow of my thoughts and it shows the breadth of my uh, transdisciplinary approach. I just would like to jump to future or how I conceptualize our future, future as homo sapiens if we want to have a dignified future. Perhaps we should never have an, an ism again, but if, why not dignityism, dignism, a turn I coined, and the humanization of globalization through egalization, my term for equal dignity, so that we can arrive at globe egalization and combine it with solidarity, so it will be co glob egalization. This is the shortest word I have found for the vision I have for a dignified future for us. As I said, I am living globally, which means I do not travel. I'm embedded in families on all continents since 45 years. This has given me a bird's eye perspective, an astronaut's perspective on us, homo sapiens. We started in Africa, and for the first 97% of our history, since about 200,000 years ago, as modern humans, we had a party. Anthropologist Bill Yuri says it was a win-win situation. I have followed the research for two decades, and I would say this is what I see too. There's a lot of research there, and I simplify it now to, you know, terribly. Okay, so we had a party, we could always go further, Simplified said we could always follow the wild food and if the planet were bigger, we would still do it today. However, at some point, something had to arrive, namely what anthropologists uh, call uh, circumscription, limitation. Robert Canero is the father of circumscription theory and I've talked with him a lot and he agrees with my use of his uh, theory that I say, limitation you know circumscription means that something we thought is limited shows itself to be we thought was unlimited shows itself to be limited for example in that case like about 10,000 years 12,000 years ago humankind learned indirectly that the surface of the planet is is finite that's just very simplified said so the next valley was taken by other people couldn't go further, you were stuck. Somehow the party was over about, it started to be over about 12,000 years ago. We call it the Neolithic revolution. We entered the, the period of a win-lose situation. This is very simplified, of course. And it doesn't mean to idealize the time before the Neolithic revolution. It means to draw out what we can use now. And I think the notion of circumscription is very useful today. So how did we adapt as humanity? Let's say if we could do a time travel, you know, far uh, uh, into the past, I think we would see that we were living together in small groups. And imagine you are respecting yourself so much and you respect everyone equally much. I think this could be more or less how we live together. There was no systematic, systemic hierarchy as not after the Neolithic Revolution. So we were. It was not so difficult to maintain unity in diversity, dialogue, 
in equal dignity. I use the lying aid as a symbol for that. What, how did we adapt about, you know, starting 12,000 years ago, he built the, what Rihanna Eisler, the social scientist, calls dominator societies. It means a strong man is at the top, normally a man. The young men are sent to the borders to defend against uh, enemies, to either kill them or die. The, the women are sent into the center, either behind the, uh, the wall of the house or the, of the village or the vale, to raise the next generation. In that context, humiliation is a duty of the master. The pater familias have the duty to beat, to humiliate routinely his underlings, to beat his disobedient wife and children and other underlings, lowly men. It was a duty, it was seen as pro-social, as, as uh, something that had to be done to keep the hierarchy in place, to teach the underlings hu meek humility and respect for the hierarchy. What happened uh, about, like, let's say 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What is the core sentence there? The core sentence is, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. Here, this sentence was unthinkable. This sentence would be, all humans are born unequal in worthiness and rights, and some are freer than others. In that context, the only people who could conceptualize humiliation as a violation were aristocrats who were equal. They could go to duel against each other. A beaten wife could not go to duel against her beating husband. All that changed. Of course, we have still a, a lot of world regions where we have that mindset now. The, I call it the honor my, mindset or ranked honor. Okay, now we, it is as if we have turned as humanity against the past 10,000 years, the past 3% of our history, and as if we went back now to the time before the Neolithic Revolution, and we say the past 10,000 years, we declare it to be illegitimate to turn people into slaves, into underlings. We build down this hierarchy again. And we invite everybody to meet at the level of equal dignity in the middle. I jump over this now and I come to the next uh, slide. Um, of course, as I said, the idea of equal worthiness is not new. Uh, it didn't come with the, the Human Rights Declaration prior to the Neolithic Revolution. And most religious awakenings started with that idea. However, they betrayed it when they established themselves uh, institutionally in the dominator context that surrounded them. Then something very interesting linguistically in 1757, in the English language, for the first time, to humiliate meant to violate the dignity of a person. In other words, humiliation from, turned from being pro-social to anti-social. Very important turning point. Of course, then came the uh, French Revolution, Egalité, um, liberty, fraternity, and then the American Declaration of Independence, then 1948. And since 1948, we speak of human rights. Even though the word dignity comes first in this core sentence, every human being is born free and equal in dignity and rights. So I think now the time has come for dignity for all, humans, animals. Let me invite you into the way people felt throughout the past 3% of, of history, our ancestors, how did they feel? Fear was definitorial. Political scientists talk about the security dilemma. Simplified said it means the people in the neighboring valley, I'm afraid that they will conquer me, enslave me. I get some weapons to defend myself. They see that, they get afraid of me, they get weapons, there is an arms race almost automatically, and the war is, is the outcome. It's a dilemma because the solution is the problem. The motto was, if you want peace, prepare for war. War for peace. Peace through military security, armed peace. My question to you, can we get out of that? And here comes this window of opportunity that I see that Nobody of our ancestors, our forefathers, foremothers, nobody had this 
what we see now, this image from outside. Whoever has traveled from their hometown to another and looked back on, on where he or she came from will, say, will know that you understand where you come from much better when you are outside. So we understand that we are one family on a tiny vulnerable planet. If we manifest that understanding, then we can exit this security dilemma, which means the more the classical security dilemma attenuates through the ingathering of humanity, the bright side of globalization, and the awareness of humankind as one family on a finite, interconnected, vulnerable planet, and the more ideals of equal dignity become salient, the more will the various fields of psychology gain significance and political science will lose it global interhuman relations rather than international relations. Humiliation will turn into the strongest obstacle to peace, particularly dignity humiliation. I call it the nuclear bomb of the emotions. Cycles of humiliation can refragment the world and bring back the classical security dilemma. Cycles of humiliation can turn a potentially united global village into a divided war zone. Here is the responsibility of, of psychology. What is humiliation? I explain it here, it's always a downward movement. Here I explain why dignity humiliation is the nuclear bomb of the emotions and is so much more intense than honor humiliation. I coined the word security dilemma too. You remember the motto of the classical one is if you want Peace, prepare for war. I think the new one is, if you want wealth, invest in exploitation. It's the famous 1% pitted against the rest. Again, we can, we have the possibility to get out of that. We can overcome the commons dilemma or the tragedy of the commons. We can turn it into the blessings of the commons, as I call it. Our planet is our commons. I see us, the global north, on the first floor of Titanic, working hard. And this entails that we make holes in the lower parts of the ship where the poor people live. We make holes there without knowing. When we are tired of doing that, we have to have vacation and we travel down in the ship on the beach and relax and then come back. And at the same time, we build stronger and stronger barriers so that the poor from down cannot come up. The, poor, the people down have one aim or among that one aim to come up. All of us together, we forget the iceberg. If we do not change the course and the design of the ship, we will go down. Also, the, which one will go down? I am sure glad the hole isn't on our end, will not work. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. Thank you, dear Catherine Odora Hopper, for sending this image from Africa. You say we can fight, we can make peace. We will all be eaten by the crocodile. I love this cartoon. In the middle down, you see what we do with our economic system at the moment. We cut the tree of life to earn a living. We as humankind can no longer think of ourselves as sailing on a luxury cruise ship. What we thought of as a cruise ship is a Titanic on its way to the iceberg. And this, while we have already punched holes in the hull of the ship to use some of the planks to throw dazzling parties on the upper floor. Slowly, we realize that we are on a lifeboat, not a cruise ship. In a lifeboat, all hands are needed on deck. Everybody has to contribute with what they can. Nobody can buy themselves out of this joint effort. Whoever tries to gain short-term personal advantages by exploiting others or ecological resources contributes to the fastest sinking of the lifeboat. Infighting will make it capsize and nobody will survive. We drown our planet, we burn it, we get too close to the wild animals, so we get pandemics, and with our industrial meat production, we even breed pandemics in the future. So, recap, important dates. We appeared, modern humans appeared circa 300, 200,000 years ago. It was a party, win-win. 
about 12,000 years ago, it changed. Uh, in Europe, much later, 5,000 years ago, different timelines. We entered a Windows time. We learned competition for domination and the security dilemma emerged. 1757, 1948, equal dignity and dignity humiliation as the nuclear bomb of the emotions is clear. 1967-72 is a revolutionary image of our planet from outside. 1980, we start to overuse our resources. We use more than one planet. The Earth overshoot day is already now at the end of July. 1991, the end of the Cold War, we had the opportunity to build this one world of unity in diversity, and we did not take this invitation. 2007 and 8, collapse of the blind belief in the wisdom of the market. Now, our responsibility to find, to experiment with, to co-create new ways to arrange our affairs on planet Earth. New win-win situation without systemic humiliation. The next form of civilization, cooperate with our own evolution with steadfast love. This is our responsibility. If we zoom in, we see 1948, and Eleanor Roosevelt, I call a moment, I call it because it was a horrifying experience with the Second World War. And after that, there was this window and there was a group of people led by Eleanor Roosevelt who took this moment and took it seriously and used it. I think we need such a moment now. I don't know, perhaps the coronavirus pandemic is that moment. I really uh, uh, recommend the work of anthropologist Alan Page Fisker. I look at the time, how much time I still have. Um, he has found out that there are four basic ways of interacting among people, which is market pricing, equality matching, authority ranking, communal sharing. Market pricing is the most quantitative, the narrowest. Communal sharing is the most qualitative and the most comprehensive. Communal sharing is what you do in a family. You give what you have and you get what you need. The problem with our society now is or globally, it, it is the world system is built like that, that market, market, market pricing leads, is, is giving priority, which means that literally we sell out the quality of our life. So if we look back and at our history from afar, we see the first 97%, we had a nice good time. Unity in diversity to make it work was not so difficult. We could spread out. Then came circumscription. The, the, the um, fact that the planet is limited in size. Today we live in times of hyper -circums circumscription. We know that also clean air, clean water, minerals, everything is limited. During the past 3% of our time here, we learned, we adapted by learning competition for domination. And now I, I want you to really remember that curve. When you listen to news that we need healthy economic growth, it is an exponential curve. This is how we, what we do, we maximize the, the adaptation we learned 10,000 years ago. We maximize it now. Now it is a suicidal path because in a limited context, you cannot do that. You have to go in circles. And you say it's not possible. Yes, for the first time in our history, it is. We have everything needed, we can do it. If you say, look here, the sustainable development goals of the UN, look at goal number eight. It's, a, it's an exponential curve. It is impossible. It will undermine all the other goals if it is taken seriously like that. I recommend um, Ruben Nielsen's talk, Civilization Next, because he has the same narrative, but he shows it differently. And he observes what also I observe, that there are a lot of initiatives, but none is going far enough. What we have is sociocide, loneliness, a Ministry of Loneliness and a Ministry of Suicide have been established in the UK. We have hateful polarization. We have cogitocide. Uh, this is new to me. Uh, I think so much uh, the president of the Club of Rome from uh, 1999 to 2007, Prince El Hassan bin Talal, he wrote to me 10 days ago that I should include that. I think it's very, very good. 
cogito side, the drowning in a sightless infosphere, the killing of the cogito sphere. The, the cogito sphere is the role of thinking and reflection. So the result is also ecocide, and Greater Thunberg is not new. There was a foreigner, Severin Suzuki, in 1992. She talked to the Earth Summit in Rio. All the world leaders listened and promised action. 20 years later, she came back to Rio and she said, nothing, altogether, nothing has happened. This last year, I fear, has not been an anomaly. It is a small taste of the future. This is the age of the long collapse. So what could be, you know, the way out? As I said, perhaps we shouldn't aim for any ism again, but if ism, what about dignity ism? This is now the last slide that I will show you and I will read you what, how I envision uh, dignity ism. A world where every newborn finds space and is nurtured to unfold the highest and best embedded in a social context of loving appreciation and connection. A world where the caring capacity of the planet guides the ways in which everybody's basic needs are met. A world where we are united in building trust and respecting human dignity and celebrating diversity, where we prevent unity from being perverted into oppressive uniformity and keep diversity from sliding into hostile division. I thank you so much for listening to me and being with me. Thank you so much, Evelyn, for that inspiring talk. Um, I just wanted to remind the attendees that you, if you have any questions to um, Evelyn or to her talk, you can put it down in the FAQ tool. And I already see them popping up. Um, first of all, um, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk, Evelyn. Um, I was just uh, wondering, I really like the metaphor of this uh, luxury cruise ship and then lifeboat. Um, and I was just wondering, because um, I've, sometimes I feel very overwhelmed when, I'm, when I've, I'm thinking, oh, we're all in this lifeboat, but I feel like the people around me, they cannot see it. Um, so maybe you have any concrete ideas how we can make people feel that they're in this lifeboat? Uh, maybe you have any suggestions when it comes to that? I think that your conference, this conference is, uh, is one initiative, conferences like that. And um, I think the, the um, bridging with, with uh, the gr greater audience, I, you know, some, some academics are in ivory towers. I try to bridge that in my work. And I think this is extremely important that we try to bridge that. And um, for every, every academic to bridge that. And I try that by really thinking about my personal life. And I think many academics could do that uh, because when I go around in the world and I speak about dignity, the first thing they ask me is, oh, who pays you? Or which university are you uh, employed with? So I have to forego any employment because it undermines my global mission of dignity. Somehow I think very, very radically about walking the talk. And I think uh, academia has a huge responsibility. Uh, my my uh, doctoral thesis was about, about the genocide in Rwanda and Somalia and the background on Nazi Germany. And in Rwanda and everywhere, you see that academics were extremely influ influential also when it came to a horrifying ma mass violence. So academia has such an important uh, responsibility and I think we should, we have to, it would be lovely if we could take it more seriously. This is just one, act, one um, aspect of it, but there are many, many more. I think it always pays to, to ask people, what do you want for, as a world for your children? That is another good question. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read out the question um it's from linda hartling and she's saying thank you for your talk um and what are some of the ways we uh each of us can overcome the domination of market pricing and encourage a stronger spirit of communal sharing yeah thank you linda linda and i we are leading together a global movement for dignity 
we are about 1,000 people at the core, about 8,000 people uh, uh, in our address list. And we are experimenting with exactly that. How can we do that? How can we somehow base ourselves on, on gift economy, for example? Communal sharing means that you give what you can and you, uh, you get what you need, that you stop calculating, that you stop the calculator in your, in your head. And so we experiment with that in our movement. And I invite everybody to go to humiliationstudies.org. There you meet both uh, Linda and me and our entire um, network. We have two conferences per year. Welcome to our conferences. Next one will be in New York. It will be online uh, in December. OK, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to check that out, definitely. Um, so what are the, the concrete uh, projects that you do with, with Linda, um, other than the conference? Yes, we have uh, launched the idea of a World Dignity University. When you, uh, when you look at the American University of Paris and its aims uh, for the next years, I have looked it up, there are similar uh, aims, let, let's say, to be more, you know, to connect global campuses. And yeah. this is basically our aim. We think that uh, to have a focus on dignity in the academic world and globally, so this is our invitation to all educators and learners in the world to give their knowledge as a gift to this World Dignity University initiative. Uh, we, by the way, we, not, we are, uh, you have a zero budget, everything is a gift. And um, so we, we also need just now somebody who carries it further. We had a wonderful director of this initiative until recently, and now we look for somebody to take over. Also for our publishing house, we have a publishing house, Dignity Press, and we, uh, we invite everybody who would like to participate. That, that sounds amazing. Um, so I was just wondering if um, any of the attendees have any more questions? because I can't see any more on the FAQ. I'm just gonna wait. Oh, there's one. Oh, two, okay. <laughs> so, um, so the one, uh, one is from Margaret Magritte. I, sorry if I spelled it uh, wrong. Um, thank you, Evelyn. Could the, could the corona pandemic crisis be the eye opener for people who believe in military-based security to look for a human security. I hope so, dear Margaret. Yes, Margrethe Tingstad. She okay, leads, sorry. <laughs> she leads the, the oldest, she leads the, in Norway, the oldest women's organization for peace. A, an amazing organization and an amazing woman. And yes, Margrethe, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, great. And next question. Um, I hope I'm saying that right, Gordana Jovanovic. I'm sorry if I said it wrong. Thank you, Evelyn, for bringing in dignity. This concept is missing in psychology. What is your explanation why people so often humiliate others and find pleasure in doing so? Wow, what a question, what a question. I have written books about that and it's, it's a pain to simply think of it. Uh, and it's getting more. It is, uh, at the moment, it's also um, exploited by profit interests. So it's amplified. A reality TV is built on that and uh, on the joy of watching humiliation. You know, when I started my research, I must admit that when I, you know, I started my doctorate on humiliation in 1997, and when I searched for the word humiliation, I found it most in pornography, in the humiliation of women in the context of pornography. So the humiliation of women is, is a, a huge, huge, huge topic. So, and of course, humiliation is everywhere in all research about bullying, mobbing, aggression. You find it every, everywhere, but usually it has not been uh, researched on its own. I am not aware of any other person who has written a doctorate on the notion of humiliation, uh, uh, taking it, you know, focusing on, on that notion. It's Linda who has written her doctorate in 1995 on humiliation, and I have written and fin finalized my work on humiliation, my doctorate in 2001. So I, I'm not aware of any 
any other doctrine in, on, on that topic. So, um, you know, I, I, I really invite everybody, if you want to know a little bit more about why it's so pleasurable to some people, uh, to go to the website, it's a huge amount of material there. Okay, yeah, because there was just a question where we can find more information about your Dignity Movement. Maybe you can just say the website one more time. It's or just I very simple. It's humiliationstudies.org, just in one word. Humiliation studies in one word. I'm gonna and I, I send you all my book manuscripts if you send me an email. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, Linda just, Linda just um, posted it in the FAQ. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, I very enjoyed your talk. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Okay, so I would ask you to turn off your camera now, uh, off now and turn off your microphone. And then I would ask Gabriel to come on stage. Gabriel, are you there? Hello, Gabriel. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, may I start or should Andrea do some introduction? I guess it was supposed to introduce all of us, then we used to start our conversation, wasn't it? Uh, excuse me? Andrea was supposed to introduce us. Ah, okay. okay, then um, Andrea, would you like to come on stage as well? Hi, sure. Uh, thank you, Lina, for your wonderful presentation. And now I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. And that is Mr. Gabriel Silva Xavier da Cimento. And he's coming from Brazil. He is uh, affiliated from the University, uh, Federal University of Brazil, UNIFESC. He's currently working on his doctorate degree in the area of education and health, so the area of death studies under Professor Sueli Salisfieldau supervision. He is also a lecturer at the Federal Institute of Sao Paulo, IF, IFSP, is an institution for higher education as well as UNIFESC, where he works as an associate professor. I think that's Sueli, associate professor. Yeah, so he's yes. a lecturer. So we are very um, happy now to have uh, uh, Mr. Gabriel Nascimento from Brazil speaking to us. Let's go. Yeah. Thank you, Andrea, for the lovely introduction. Uh, and thank you, Evelyn, for the great talk you just gave us. It's really good to hear something like this because it makes us believe that there is hope for a new and better future. So thank you really much. So, um, First of all, good afternoon, everyone. I must say that it's an amazing opportunity for me to be here among such an amazing group of researchers. For the past days, the PCG, PGC has been an awesome experience to me. But I must also say that I'm really, really, really nervous because it's my first time presenting a research in English. So if I pass out or fall down, please don't laugh. And don't worry, I'll try to get back. But if I don't manage to get back, please call the rescue. Anyway. What I'm about to present to you uh, is an ongoing piece of research, and I really hope to make myself understood, and I promise to be better next time. So let's just try to share my screen so that you can see. And we start. Right, here it is. So, although the title of my research may seem a little dramatic, since it involves something like deadly silence, it is purely intentional because um, we seek to bring to discussion the risks that the lack of information concerning or regarding deaf people about the context of pandemic has deadly and serious risks to all of our lives, both deaf and hearing people as well, since we are all living in this pandemic context worldwide. So where did this idea come from? At first, I must say that uh, as you can see probably on this citation by Sparks, uh, this idea to research did not come out of the blue. It actually involves a lot of personal and relationship to us because as researchers, we are all somehow related to deaf movements here in Brazil. 
Uh, I myself work as a sign language teacher and also sign language translator and interpreter. And I have a close relationship to the deaf community for quite a long time. Even my parents-in-law are both deaf, which makes me even closer to their cause. And really, I am really aware of their struggles along for the, for the past two or three decades. So uh, the other researcher I'm going to present to you right now is, sorry, those are the three researchers that are working on this, this presentation actually that I'm showing you now. The first one is myself as I work as a sign language teacher and translator, and I also have deaf relatives. So that makes me really close to the cause. The second one, Professor Sueli, she's a teacher and translator also. And she, she, was sick, she got sick last night, so we couldn't attend. So I apologize for her absence. I was really hoping that she was here to help me in case I fail or didn't manage to explain correctly all the stuff I, I have to. And the third one is Eliezer, who happens to be my husband. He's also a sign language interpreter and what we call CODA. CODA is an abbreviation that stands for Children of Deaf Adults, which means both his parents are also deaf. So this idea to research and discuss the theme regarding accessibility and deaf education here in Brazil uh, is really, really important for us because we live it daily, whether it's with our fellows or friends who are deaf or even our relatives or teachers who are also deaf and work with us as it happens to me and Sweeney. Just to give a quick start, I enlisted here uh, uh, some historic, event, historic events that would help us to contextualize what really is happening now here in Brazil regarding deaf education and how it will later on affect all the things in this pandemic context. So the deaf education in Brazil started in 1857, where the, when the first deaf school was founded here. Uh, it was by request of the Imperial Pedro II, who requested and invited a French deaf teacher named Ernest Hue to come here in Brazil and start the foundation of the, what would be later on the basis of deaf education here in Brazil. So at first there was a school and there was a deaf teacher who taught deaf, uh, French sign language and written French here in Brazil. But as it happens, Ines, which is the name of the school, is a boarding school. So deaf from all across the country used to come to that place, study during the periods of study. And then when they returned home, they would share what they learned inside the institute with all deaf peers and transform that knowledge so that then when they managed to get back to the Ines, they would learn new things and reshape what they, what they had already learned. So this is kind of a cycle movement. They was boarding school, learning stuff, getting back in home, sharing what they've learned, and then getting back to the institute and sharing again and reshaping all the knowledge they acquired along this. Um, nowadays, this school was renamed to deaf Educational to National Institute of Deaf Education, and it, see, it was linked to the federal government as a public school. So it offers every level of education for deaf people, starting from basic school to college. Uh, moving on, Brazilian Sign Language, which we call Libras here, was recognized legally in 2002. So it's really recent when we talk about language. It's really recent here. But legally recognized doesn't mean it doesn't exist before. Actually, it did, but there were a lot of research and work and struggling movements in order to make it recognized by law. When a language is recognized here, through law, it means that it finally can be used as a method and as a way of education and instruction. But despite that, deaf education has been really, has suffered many, many problems along history for the past 160 years here in Brazil. At first, sign language was the first and main way of instruction for the deaf. So everything was taught in sign language and then they would learn the written language as well. After 100, one, I'm sorry, after 1880, there was a Congress in Italy named Congress of Milan. Where there, they decided that the oral methods were really better for the deaf instead of using sign language. At that time, they believed that sign language was a way to make 
but they're lazy or not put some effort into learning to speak orally with their voices, as well as do lip reading. So the decision made that happened there in Congress of Milan uh, spread across the whole world. Even Brazil was one of the countries that accepted that really the oral method, which was focused on speaking and lip reading, was the best way to teach a deaf. So all the, the years that the deaf spent inside the institute learning sign language and forming themselves and training new teachers that would later on work in the institute as well, were kind of lost. And it was kind of changed to the oral method. Uh, a few years later, this oral method didn't prove to be enough, it didn't give enough results as they expected. So they kind of changed it back by mixing both oral language and sign language. But from 2002 and on, what happened is that the, the sign language was come for centered in discussions again, and they decided that it should be back in deaf instruction, which, which gave the emergency to new bilingual practice in which sign language was first thought to the deaf people, and then they could learn written Portuguese. So that's kind of a little brief of the history of deaf education here in Brazil. Um, all of these advances and setbacks kind of undermine the possibilities of establishing a bilingual model in which a deaf education can really happen effectively here in Brazil. As a result of, of this setbacks too, there are a few problems that affect deaf education really harshly nowadays. The first one is, is that their access to sign language happens too late, actually, too late. Uh, usually the first time with sign language happens when they enter school by the age of six or seven years old. Uh, before that, they, they have usually don't have contact with a sign language since both their parents are usually hearing. So they kind of communicate through gestures and mimics inside their homes or combine signs that does not really constitute a part of the lexical of the sign languages, which is really a problem. The second problem is that their access to Portuguese, written Portuguese, also happens later on. If they, even, they didn't even have access to a first language, and then we are supposed to teach them a second language, which is written Portuguese. But the methodology usually applied into teaching Portuguese, written Portuguese are usually based on sound and strategies meant for hearing kids which does not really apply naturally to the deaf ones. So it's really a problem because at some point in there, even most of them reach high school or college without knowing basic skills to read and write in Portuguese. And also most of them don't really have proper access to sign language, which leads them to communicate through signs on a basic level or a true basic level with a restrict vocabulary. So it's really a problem. And the third problem is that nowadays here in Brazil, we have what we call the inclusion system. Through this system, the deaf kids don't really have too much contact with their deaf peers because they are usually put inside the classrooms that, uh, that is a majority group who is hearing, who are hearing students. So that's really a problem for them because they don't really have a peer to mirror or a role to inspire and communicate in sign language naturally even though there is usually a sign language interpreter inside this context or classrooms, which we call inclusive classrooms, they still lack the, the contact with their peers, which is a problem for us. Due to that, a few things have been happening in the deaf education here in Brazil. The first one is that they usually put into a condition of almost illiteracy, which means they uh, hardly can read and write basic stuff in Portuguese. And just to set for an example, last year, I, I got a new student who enrolled in one of my, my courses and she couldn't really spell the name of his mother, which was really something astonishing for me because how can someone, a kid in the first year of high school does not know the name of his own mother. It's really, really surprising for me. So uh, another, the second result of it is that they, since they don't manage to learn Portuguese quite as well, they also have some trouble into lip reading because they don't know the words, so lip reading does not really work effectively for them. And the third result is that they are in constant need of the presence of 
sign language interpreters because sometimes you give them basic text written in written Portuguese, they get to it, they watch it, they see it, but they can't really understand it. Or at least they can understand a few words, but out of the context, which doesn't really help a lot to understand the full information that they were supposed to acquire. Uh, moving on, and now about the pandemic context and this problem. So I kind of showed you there are a few problems affected or resulted in deaf education in Brazil throughout the time. Since they have late access to sign language and usually have some trouble learning reading Portuguese, it's obviously that they would really have some trouble into accessing information regarding things that are really, really important at this moment, such as information on or about coronavirus and COVID-19. So what really happens to it? One of the, the, the worst problems here in Brazil now is that there, are, there is a law that states that the presence of sign language interpreters is mandatory in public spaces. So whenever a deaf person needs to go to a hospital or drugstore or needs to a public place that offers public services, there should be a sign language interpreter ready to, to mediate their communication. But there's still a, a, a gap between what's proposed in the law and the practice for real. That's really, really a problem. So whenever a deaf needs to go to a public place, there is always that struggle to ask for and kind of fight for it. You know, they always have to say, I have my rights, I need an interpreter and they should be here. And that sometimes takes too long and there are a lot of losses from it. Um, another problem is that on the mainstream media, there are no, pre are rarely, sorry, on mainstream media, we don't usually find sign language interpreters. So it's really hard for them. As hearing people, when we turn on TV or read the newspaper or even through the internet, we can get full access of information regarding coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, countermeasures or guidelines to prevent contagion from, the, from it. But as a deaf person who usually cannot read, they don't really have access to it because there are no sign language interpreters on the mainstream media. And even if the programming has subtitle or closed captions, most of them cannot read it. Or the most, the, the, as sometimes they can only get some few words isolated and try to deduce their meaning or the full context. So the construction of meaning usually happens between their own peers, like this. One of the deaf sees something on TV or try to read this, the captioning or subtitle, then he kind of imagines what it means or tries to deduce its context. And then he replies to another deaf person who passes it on and on and on. That's really how it happens now. Another problem is that there are not enough information uh, printed or translated into sign language that could help them understand better the context and avoid and prevent themselves and take care of themselves. Uh, so even though there's a law that says it has to be like this, there must be interpreters, but it just doesn't really happen. The group of oral community of sign language interpreters have united and created the Facebook page group where they can get as much information they try to and translate it into sign language. It's like, let's suppose there's some really uh, important information that they get or some information in general regarding guidelines to prevent uh, coronavirus. And they get this information, translate it into a video and post it on the Facebook group. Then the deaf people who are in this group can watch it, understand it. And if they have some questions or doubts about it, they can just post it to another video that will be quickly replied by another interpreter. But this is a voluntary group. This is not really an action from the government. There's really some action of the deaf, the deaf sign language interpreters. So what about the government of Brazil regarding this accessibility to information regarding coronavirus? Um, I must say sadly that we are facing some really, really troublesome times here in Brazil, especially now with our new president called Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro has one remarkable thing since before, even before he was elected, he always kept a sign language interpreter alongside him. So as you can see on the first picture on the left, there's a, he's making a live transmission through his Facebook page, it was before the elections, and there's already a sign language interpreter on his right side. 
So he usually during the whole campaign was using sign language as a way to convince deaf people to vote for him or support him. And that really, really happened because most of the deaf people were supporting Bolsonaro, not because of his uh, plan to govern, but because he was making the contact or the information accessible to them through a sign language interpreter. Uh, another thing happened and was in his first speech as president, the first lady also followed by Bolsonaro delivered her whole speech in Latin sign language. That caused the communi deaf community to steer because it was something unprecedented. They had, they had never seen before sign language being used by someone in the top of the government. So that kind of, kind of caused the commotion and they were really happy and proud to see their language up there. Uh, after that, Bolsonaro keeps using sign language interprets in all his pronouncements or warnings or whenever he makes live transmissions through Facebook in order to conduct his supporters. So it keeps happening when it's with him or regarding his government. But on the other areas of even public spaces, he doesn't really care about it. And on the contrary, in December last year, she published a new decree which extinguished the card, the, 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 the work of uh, the occupation of sign language interpreters, which means that they cannot be hired anymore or they, work, they should work voluntarily or they should not work at all. That's really how he reacts to it. Another really troublesome thing is that uh, as may be reported worldwide, his behavior regarding coronavirus and COVID-19 is not really what we expect of a governor or president at all. Uh, so I can, I can name a few things that he's been doing in the past days or months even regarding this theme. As just set for an example, whenever the World Health Organization publish some kind of orientation or warning or guidelines in order to prevent coronavirus, he usually contravenes it. He doesn't really believe it. And he tries to convince people that it's just not really important at all. A second thing is, is that really states a lot of times, like twice or three times during his live transmissions or even communicating to the press conference that COVID-19 is not, it's not really dangerous. It's just a flu, so people don't really have to worry about it, especially if you have some, some background being an athlete or something like this, doing sports. Another thing he said frequently is that uh, coronavirus is just an imaginary threat created by mass media in order to scare people and try to take him out of his place or make his, his his work seems not really as good as it should. And he also criticizes and even published some really harsh words towards governors that really uh, try to apply policies for social distancing or something like that. So now the context here in Brazil is really, really difficult to deal with because there is kind of this polarization in which there's the left parties and the the right parties always fight in each other and we are kind of in the middle of it and suffering all the consequences of, lack of, of the lack of actions that could really help us overcome this problem we are facing now. Another thing Bolsonaro also does frequently is summon people or motivate them to agglomerate and protest against uh, social distancing. That's really, really a problem because he not only kind of induce people to do it and to agglomerate and to get together, but he also joins them, usually not wearing masks and touching hands and cell phones at all. So he kind of exposes himself to it and exposes all the people around it and that those crowded places, which is really, really a problem for us. Uh, just almost finishing it. Uh, he also indicates the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine as a safe and effective medicine to root out coronavirus, which is really a problem because there are a lot of studies that really shows that this information is kind of controversial since uh, the use of this, this medicine has been really tested and not proven effective at all when it comes to it. In fact, there are some studies that show that the number of people who died because of the use of this medicine 
it's kind of growing. So it's really not safe, but it kind of makes people believe that by using chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine med medicines, they would get rid of it and be safe at all with no other problems. And for the last, one of his most, uh, he also stands against science at all. Whenever someone points out some study that could really help out solve the problem or think on, about new strategies that could help us get out of the situation, he kind of denies it, so it's not really worth it and that people should not pay attention to it. So it's really, really harsh for us to do it. So uh, now that I've shown you the kind of context we are living in, you see that's really a problem for us who are hearing and have access to the whole kind of information that the government produces daily to us. But when it comes to deaf people, it's even harder because they don't really have access to all that information. Or I can say that even worse because they do have some access to information, but those information provided by the president himself, which is kind of what I already told you about in the last slide. So it's really, really something we should worry about because some deaf people really believe that coronavirus and the pandemic context is not really a problem and it, their lives are not really in danger. So they kind of expose themselves to it. And at the same time, they can really become some kind of pathological agents to carry out the virus and, and transmit it to other people as well. So it's really a problem for us. So this whole context is what really makes made us think about it and, and start to investigate how this information was getting to the deaf people, how they were dealing with it, and how they can really cope with these problems, even if there are groups of sign language interpreters volunteering to help them out and help them understand the situation and the, the, the danger they are putting their lives at. So as, as a matter of methodology, this research, uh, at first I, I, we thought about interviewing a few deaf people that could really help us because the whole scenario in, in Brazil is, is not really that much different. Uh, when you live near a capital or a huge or a more developed city, the chances that the deaf people have more access to education are really bigger. But when you go to countryside, it's really, really kind of the same in the whole country. So still most part of the people who cannot read in Portuguese or have poor access to sign language or even lacks in presence of sign language interpreters for the most parts of their lives. So they really, really, there's a gap of information between what they should learn and what they, they really learn, sorry. So at first we thought about interviewing a few deaf within our context, someone we can really could contact with or share information and talk about some stuff. But after that we thought, well, if we do this, we, can, we, we will kind of restrain our scope of analysis to a specific group. This is not really our intention. So we decided to spread a questionnaire or a survey with 20 questions to deaf people uh, scattered all across the country in each of the five regions of Brazil. Uh, of the people who responded to us randomly, there were deaf, 10 deaf people, two hard of hearing person. Uh, so we have respondents from all five regions in Brazil, all of them adults from the age 23 to 64 years old, which we we, we, could, we wanted to reach those people who are usually mature, mature and could understand better the information. I mean, if you get a teenager or a kid in the, the school time, he could probably not have full access to all it should, but an adult person is expected to learn and know stuff about how to prevent coronavirus. So this is why we chose the specific group. About the questions, we divided them in three different categories. The first category intended to learn to know where they were from, uh, their condition, if they were born deaf or they lost their hearing after some time due to, a, to some disease or, or accident or whatever. And also the, which one was their first language or which was, whether it was Portuguese or sign language, because it makes a whole difference. If the first language is Portuguese, it means that they really had access to reading and writing skills in the right time. So there should not be as much problem to read and get information as it should to the, old, to the other ones that cannot read, for example. The second category of questions were related to where they could get information and 
through which sources they were usually in contact with. And the third category of questions was supposed to verify how much they knew about coronavirus and how much accessibility really could help them in this context to understand better and to share that information with their deaf peers. So these are the questions I am just pointing forward. So at first we thought it's a really quick, some really objective questions. So the answers will be kind of short too. So we will analyze it objectively. But when we got the, the responses for the questions that we asked them, there were really, really, really a huge amount of information that really deserves to, to be analyzed profoundly. So I'm presenting a few of these data for you so we can discuss later if you feel like we need to. Uh, when it comes to the question about their deafness, whether they were born deaf or they, lose, they lost their hearing after, 75% uh, of them was born deaf. Uh, so that means that most part of them should have had sign language as a mother tongue, which doesn't really happen at all. Because if we see the other graphic, uh, there's a huge part of them who still have Brazilian sign language at first language, but when they responded, they mean to say that they learned it while they were at school and not at home, as it should be naturally with anyone, as we're hearing people learn our oral language with, with our parents or siblings or whatever. These other graphics show that a few interesting data too. And when it comes to understanding a written text in Portuguese, uh, the majority of the group said that they have some difficult, but this but here expresses that a few words they can understand, they can understand, but when it comes to the full comprehension of the context, it becomes really, really hard for them to get it as it should. Also, there's a huge amount of them who cannot lip read. That's obviously related to their skills in Portuguese too, because if they don't know the word or how to write it or how to read it, they would have some trouble when it comes to lip reading it too. And there, when it comes to where they get the news, it was really, really interesting because some of them said that they use closed caption. A huge part of them said that they don't really care about watching news since there are no sign language interpreters. It's really, really hard for them to keep reading all the time the closed caption resources. Uh, when we asked them about where they prefer to get information or what, or where they were most likely to get informed, uh, the social media appeared as so really, really many people indicated it, especially Facebook. One of the, the reasons for that is that there is a group, as I mentioned before, of volunteer interpreters that really help them get some information about coronavirus and stuff. Uh, when it comes to information specific regarding coronavirus and COVID-19, like, for example, to distinguish one from another, uh, they managed to get some information. It's like basic stuff, like I need to wash my hands, use alcohol to, to prevent it, or even wear masks. That stuff they really know about. But when it comes to, when we ask questions like, uh, where did coronavirus come from, or how is it transmitted, or any specific things like what is COVID-19, for example, to distinguish the virus from the disease, disease uh, they don't really, could be, they couldn't really answer that. So as a, um, how can I say, summarizing the information that we got from them, we could say that uh, they do not understand clearly things or information about coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, most of them get information through the deaf peers or through the group of volunteer interpreters. Uh, just a few of them can read and therefore get information about the context uh, and share with, with the deaf, deaf peers too. And there's a risk that they, since they only have full access to what the president is saying, that they just believe him if they don't have another source of information to compare and criticize or develop their own thinking about this. So if there's someone saying to them with the presence of sign language that hydroxychloroquine is good, is effective in the, to avoid or to, to eradicate coronavirus or COVID-19, 
they, they would kind of believe it. So if the president says that the, there's no risk and that they can go out and go to schools and work and gather with their friends, they will kind of believe it too. But when there's another source of information that shows them that no, the whole world is actually worried about it and we need to practice social distancing for now because it seems to be the only way to avoid the spread of the virus, they kind of put both information to compare and say, well, there's something wrong about this. So many people are telling me that it's really dangerous and there are a lot of people dying. Just for instance, we have reached last week 25,000 deceased people due to the coronavirus here in Brazil, which puts us almost as a new epicenter of the world when it comes to the disease. It's really, really worrying. Another thing is that they are partially aware of how the virus can spread or how they can avoid it too. And when it comes to social emotional impacts, most of them feel, have been feeling lonely about it because uh, deaf people usually meet their peers inside of deaf associations or public spaces where they can talk in sign language, speak sign language and have conversation with. Of course, nowadays we have technologies that allows them to keep this conversation through video callings, whether it's from, from Facebook or other media so, or softwares, but they really lack their contact with their peers to visit one another, to stay in touch with another, to go to school where they usually meet their sign language interpreters to whom they can talk and share information and anyway. Uh, another thing is, is that they seem to be really scared about, some of them show to be scared, like, am I going to die if I manage to get, if I get coronavirus or is it okay? Am I strong enough to, to resist it? There are kind of these thoughts in, the, in, the, in their heads. Just to finish it, then since deaf people are not having full access to information as we clearly stated here, uh, that is, this is just still a really, really big problem for us to worry about because since they don't have access to accurate information, not only they put themselves in, in risks, but they, always, they also risk us. They, always, they also put us in danger because of this lack of information. So even though I put some effort into it by telling all my deaf friends that no, we should stay at home, no, we should avoid, and yes, we should apply or practice social distancing, there's not really certainty that they will believe me because there's a, gov there's a president always saying on TV that there is no problem at all and they, they should live their lives as anyone else. Uh, another thing that we pointed out in, in this research is that when it comes to the heart of hearing, which are those people who were not born deaf and usually communicate through their voices and lip reading, it's really a problem when we have to use or wear the masks because it kind of covers the lips. So it avoids people to make the lip reading and understand the information. So the hard of hearing people have been facing some really uh, hard problems, like when they need to specifically go to a hospital or go to a drugstore, they try to, to talk and, and share their needs, but they are not understood because sometimes their pronunciation is not as good as it should be. And also they cannot acquire specific information because the attendants or salesperson are always use wearing masks, blocking their view to their lips, which is really a problem for them too. Well, I kind of, I think this is it. I, I thank you for the patience to, to watch me until now. I really hope I could make myself understood. I, I said earlier that I was really, really nervous because it's really my first time but I'm glad I didn't pass out and I hope you could understand something about our research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriel, um, for that insightful uh, talk um, on inclusion. Uh, I didn't have the feeling that you're gonna pass out at any second, so you're totally fine. Um, I didn't really think that you were nervous at all, so good job. Um, Thank you. And for the attendees, you can drop your questions down in the FAQ. Um, I myself found, found the topic very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm also in, involved in 
assisting disabled people. And um, one of my one of my clients, um, he uh, he's got spasticity. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but he also cannot hear very well. So he's also lip reading all the time. And he has been saying that he um, had some troubles with, obviously because we in Germany, we have to wear masks. It's, um, we ha it's mandatory, we have to do it. Um, so um, he was telling me that he has got some problems lip reading, but he posted on Facebook that um, now people are trying to produce like see-through masks. Have you heard of that, Gabriel? Yes, but at the same it's time, humans, the they try to, they try, oh, can I, can I answer or should I explain? Yeah, 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 no worries. Well, here in Brazil, there were some people trying to, to make this mask where they can see through and see their lips. But on the other hand, there was another group of people saying that uh, that material which they made that visible is not safe enough to contain the, the virus, for example. And also not many people have access to it. Some people don't really have access to basic, really quality masks. So they kind of buy that disposable ones or they make home masks that they can use by combining two kinds of fabric and make it trying to protect themselves from it. Yeah. But I, I was really hoping that this idea of making the lips visible would spread. Yeah, um, I, I'm hoping so too, because he has got some problems with it. Um, uh, I, I mean, because of um, Bolsonaro's policy, you don't have to wear masks in Brazil, right? It's not by law. Well, that depends. We have states in which it's mandatory to use the mask. Like I live in Sao Paulo, which is one of the most popular states. And here we do have to use it whenever we get out of homes. And most of the, the stores are closed, thankfully. But this is really a problem because when our governor here in Sao Paulo say that we must practice social distancing, stay home, wear masks, and close the store like malls and stuff, comes Bolsonaro and says that our governor is wrong, they shouldn't do it, and in the future we're gonna have problem, the economy is stopping, so the country is gonna be broke in a few time. So please, please stop listening to the governor and go to the streets. So it's kind of, uh, you're always fighting each other and swearing in TV or live transmissions as well. So it's really troublesome because yes, here in Zimbabwe we do have to wear masks, but at the same time, the president says that people shouldn't. And so a few people start, decide to believe in him. So they don't wear it. And it's really bad because sometimes I have to go to the supermarket and those really, really neat times. And when I get there, uh, people are in line and I kind of look back and see, they should be respecting that decency of two meters like this. But they're not, they're really kind of close to you. And, uh, something really funny happened last week. I had to go to the supermarket and there was this lady, she was supposed to wear a mask, but then she put it, uh, she put it down and starts talking on her phone and really, really close to me. Uh, then I, I gently asked her, man, could you please put on your mask? And she said, don't worry, I do not have coronavirus. Then I replied, but I do. Then she quickly put it back and like, she was scared. Of course I was kidding, but it was really one way I found to make her believe that it was really necessary. Uh, but she believed she was in danger, so she kind of put it back when it should be on since the beginning. So, so most part of people still do not believe because Bolsonaro said it's not really need. You don't have to use masks, it's okay, it's just an imaginary threat. So no one's gonna die as long as you practice sports or have an athlete story. Yeah, I mean, that, that's such a shame. Um, but I mean, he, he's the political leader of your country. So it is understandable that people do listen to him, um, unfortunately. Um, are there like, um, like protests against his policy when it comes to coronavirus? No, I mean protests against his policies? No, he summoned people to protest against our government policies. But like even the ones who do not support Bolsonaro, like me, we try to make people conscious, aware about it by using social media or texting or video 
as a sign language interpreter, I usually produce or make some video of myself signing and sharing information with them too, but we do not go to the streets to protest against him. Uh, right now, there's there are a few impeachment process go trying to get on, but I don't think they're going past. Uh, so unfortunately, we kind of can't do anything right now. And the number of deceased people is kind of raising exponentially. We kind of worried about that. Sometimes I even think, oh God, am I going to die too? Because each day, like last, last night, 1,000 people died due to coronavirus here. It's really, really a, a worrying number. But we cannot really do much, only protest against him virtually or try to avoid the stuff or ignore him as advices. But other than that, there has no been protestry. Even because here in Sao Paulo, it's one of the most affected states in Brazil with a large number of cases of COVID-19. So it's really not safe to go out on the streets and protest against him right now. Yeah, so it's better to protest virtually. I understand. Um, we have a few questions coming in, Gabriel. I'm just going to read them out for you. Um, Linda Hartling is saying, thank you for your important research. Thank you so much for reminding us that language is an es um, essential lifeline, especially, especially during times of crisis. Sign language is such an important part of the invisible infrastructure that needs to be strengthened, strengthened throughout the world. What are some key ways we can educate others about your work? You have to unmute yourself again, Gabriel. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, thank you, Linda, for your question. Well, uh, there are some things we can do about, about it to help people understand the, the stuff about deaf and deaf culture. The first thing is to recognize the sign language are human language like any other. Like it's, it doesn't see, it seems unnatural for us because we are, we are born hearing. So we learn our language since the beginning of time with the contact of our parents or siblings or friends at all. But some people have some trouble to understand that when it comes to deaf people, a hearing or listening is not really a way for them to learn naturally. They do really have to have access to a language, sign language. And one thing we can do is try to explain to them that sign language is a full and complete language like any other. So for me, it's really hard to be here and speak English because there are a lot of grammar rules and vocabulary that I don't really have at this point. But when it comes to sign language, the same thing happens. And it's really funny because when we start in sign language course, a lot of people enroll to it. Like we have 50 students at the beginning but when they realize that we have to also to start grammar stuff, they kind of uh, abandon it. They skip it and no, I don't want to learn because it's too hard, it's too difficult. But any language, or it's kind of difficult as well. So the first thing we must do is kind of spread it to it that these sign languages are human language. They must be respected as well. And try to learn at least the basic of it too, because sometimes you're going to meet and have people, whether it's in a store or a mall or a movie or whatever, go to a place where you have to talk, or then kind of might need information about it. The second step is we got to fight like we are doing here now in Brazil, and we have been doing this for the past few decades. We have to fight for a model of education in which those that people have access to the sign language and the written language as soon as possible, because today they only have access it when, to, when they go to the schools. And that's really a problem because they spend like six or seven years kind of isolated of or with restricted information and communication between their parents. So sometimes you can ask a deaf in high school, basic question like, uh, what is global warming? And he will not answer to you because he doesn't really know what it is. But he spent nine years of studying before that and he didn't learn that because it wasn't really made accessible for them. So education is really a problem. And I think it's one of the center of the things that we must focus on now that ensure that they have access to sign language and also written language. As long as a deaf person is bilingual or becomes bilingual, it's really, really easier for them to adjust and live in a world. Of course, I don't expect everything to be translated into sign language like traffic or, or stuff, but if they can at least learn the basic and read it and they could do it by themselves without the help of the sign language in some times. 
of course, when there's a conference like this, where we are all speaking in oral language, they will need a sign language interpreter to make sure that they understand the full information that we are providing to them. Yeah, yeah I was, I, sorry, I was actually just thinking about that, um, how it would, would have been cool if your, um, if your talk would have been uh, with sign language as well, but um, that put aside. <laughs> Yeah, I, even I thought about it. I at first I I was I thought maybe I could do this lecture in sign language. Then I realized that no one could translate it to you guys who doesn't speak sign language. Uh, but here, uh, yeah, not only here but also in, in several countries. Whenever there is a conference, there's usually the presence of a sign language interpreter too. I myself work like this too. We have been organizing a few research events here in Brazil. So whenever there's someone lecturing or making a speech, leaving a speech, I usually come as a translator in like one of those windows we're seeing here right now. So it's really, really usual. And sometimes we do the opposite. We, we do our lectures in sign language and hire another interpreter who is kind of translated it into Portuguese or English or whatever language they were using the conference. I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, Gabriel, but we're running out of time and the others want to speak too. Um, so um, there is another question, but maybe you can um, you can uh, po you can say your email address or something like that, so people can reach you if they have uh, any more um, questions. Do you want to tell the audience your email address or no? I'm going to type it. I think it's going to be easier, right? Yeah, you can type it as well. No worries. Oh, okay. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Um, I really appreciate your work. Um, and yeah, thank you for your talk. Okay, You're welcome. Um, the next person would be uh, Andrea coming on stage. Uh, Gabriel, could you please turn off your, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gabriel, for your nice and interesting presentation. Actually gives really uh, interesting context to my talk because uh, I will continue talking about the face mask. So the next presenter is myself, and I will read my bio, although it seems that I don't know myself. So Andrea Claudia Valente earned her PhD and MA in Humanities at the York University in Toronto, Canada, and her MA in Applied Linguistics at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. She has been in academia teaching for the past 20 years, and she is a contract faculty at York University. She's been a member of various associations in the field of communication, human communication, rhetoric and discourse analysis, second language education, and psychology. She's interested in transdisciplinary studies across the humanities and the sciences. For example, she has created a notion of neuroautobiographies for life stories that deal with neurological and mental health conditions. So people that had such conditions <clears throat> So she writes, they write about that. So, um, so I'm the next presenter and I will share with you then my screen. Um. Yes. So I hope you can see now my screen and the title of my presentation is Mascara Salva is a hashtag. So that was in the Twitter and that's what I'm gonna talk about and is the redefining, redefining the self amid the corona, corona, coronavirus pandemic. So um, it's good that so Gabriel has talked a little bit about the context in Brazil because that's where I'm gonna look at from more an academic perspective, more from a scholarly perspective of what is being the use and the way of the face masks in public setting. So this ex presentation explores the use of face masks amid the coronavirus pandemic in the Brazilian context. And as said before, they are also having their own political economic crisis right now. So the way of protective masks against contagious disease among healthy populations has been recorded since the Spanish flu as a result of public health preventative measures and government policies. On a recent paper about the history of protective masks during pandemic, Strasser and Schillisch mentioned that during the 1918-19 influenza pandemic, 
Wearing a mask became mandatory for police forces, medical workers, and even residents in some U.S. cities, although its use was often controversial. Yet in cities like San Francisco, the decline in deaths from influenza was partly attributed to the mandatory mask wearing policies. At this point, the rationale for wearing masks moved beyond their original use in the operating theater. They now also protected the wearer against infection, and that was in 1918. Such rationale is still supported today under the conditions of the global COVID-19 pandemic, as many governments have decreed mandatory protective face shields and surgical masks for the frontline workers and protective masks like homemade masks and bandana for the general population when sharing public space when they cannot keep the social distance. Similarly, mandatory mask wearing policies are still not free from controversies, mainly when the target is the general population. On the, on one of the reasons is the lack of consensus among authoritative institutions. For example, WHO and the uh, Pan American Organization of Health use the words recommendations, considerations to the way of face masks on their reports, whereas local governments enforce laws against general population if the masks are not used in non-health settings. Moreover, the shortages of surgical masks and their high cost due to the demand pressure production of homemade masks that may not follow health safety protocols. So we are dealing here with a high demand and not having enough with high costs and homemade masks that do not follow safety protocols. Last, to assure effective protection, individuals should be cautious when wearing a face mask, removing it and disposing it, which although seems a simple act, there has been many anecdotes that illustrate people's lack of knowledge of how to handle the mask without getting self-infected. So now I'm going to go into the Brazil context uh, as you have the next slide. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly destabilized vulnerable countries which have been facing internal political crisis. Brazil is one of them. In response to the Brazilian presidents, now you know Bolsonaro and you have the picture from previously in this slide that Gabriel presented. So, uh, so the Brazilian president, with his curious behavior during the pandemic, so it really created lots of um, reactions, right? So in, in this res as a response, a group of private bankers, medical professionals, and local corporations have joined forces to create an initiative project called Todos Pela Saúde, all for health, as you can see in the slide. And they kick off a campaign called Mascara Salva on May 1st, 2020. So you can see here in the slide and how, you know, uh, their mission that is to uh, be for everyone's health. And they launched this movement, Mascara Salva. So there is the hashtag Mascara Salva that people could use in the social media. And they want to remind the population that the mask is for preventative measures, should be used for preventative measures. And they wanted to educate the population how to use it correctly and how to be, uh, to sanitize it and so on. So this is a group of private uh, organizers, corporations that took the lead to, in response to the president that seemed not to be uh, caring about his own citizens. So the campaign, that's Mascara Salva, involves the participation of celebrities uh, recording video clips. For example, you have a here on the screen, a singer, a male singer called Roberto Carlos, if you're not familiar with Brazilian culture, that he's a icon in the Brazilian popular music. And also have here Yvette Sangalo on the, um, my right here, that she's also a very 
famous singer for a younger generation. So you actually, you have two generations here. He is almost in his 80s. He just turned 79. And that was also, um, he had a live uh, singing in also celebrating his birthday. And you have Yvette Sangalo, that is a younger person, right? And uh, she, so she also uh, campaigned for wearing the mask. So, so these artists, they, them, this two of them, and there are others, they endorse the use of face masks for the general population. The public identify with the celebrities who set a model to be followed. In this case, it is to incorporate a new habit of wearing a face mask, which is framed under the discourse of self-care and care. As Susan states, people are especially likely to conform when the group consists of people whom subjects like or admire or with whom they otherwise feel connected. So it's much easier to educate the mass through celebrities rather than teachers or scientists that the mass wouldn't be uh, seen themselves. So it's easier to um, deliver the message and help them conform with once they see that their idols are doing that. Thus, by adhering and conforming to the campaign Ma uh, Mascara Salva, Brazilian citizens expressed their disapproval to the president after his notorious response to the media, and so what? Showing that he neither fears the virus nor the death that lurk across the country. His citizens lose trust in his governance for being not a good enough president in Winnicott's sense, that abandons his people. In this manner, conformity gains political dimensions when Brazilian citizens decided to wear the face mask that symbolizes their discontentment and shaming for the president. So I use it here the notion of conformity and I want to understand that the ones that are, you know, wearing the mask and tweeting mascara salva, they are conforming. And to tell you the truth, I was interesting because when I start reading about the news in Brazil, being here in Canada, but reading the news from about Brazil, I was wondering if, you know, it's a big country, if the people would adhere to this new habit. So that was my hypothesis, if they would. So then I start researching more about this new habit there. The study of human behavior in relation to conformity, that means to follow the crowd, has been widely studied in experimental psychology. The famous experiments conducted by Ash and Milgram in the 50s, 60s, have shown that human beings conform before an authority figure and under peer pressure. Without questioning the validity of the information, the degree of ethics, or the common sense. In other words, under peer pressure, an individual internalizes some information, habit, or even idea, even if they have initially believed it was incorrect or unethical. In the example of the Mascara Salva campaign, some individuals may feel under peer pressure and feel compared to wearing a face mask even when it's not necessary, such as performing solo activities as jogging, walking around an empty uh, park, or driving a car. The conformity to wear a face mask is due to the uncertainties created amid the pandemic. In fact, the individual lacks the scientific knowledge that can explain to themselves how a face mask can prevent infection. As Sustain states, difficult tasks leave people with a great deal of uncertainty about whether they are right. In such circumstances, people are all the more likely to give way to the views of others, simply because those views may well be the most reliable source of information. The peer pressure in the Mascara Salva movement is created by the social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. 
that focus on delivering convincing messages through well-elaborate rhetoric strategies to stir up the audience emotions. The mass will not search for scientific papers to confirm the functionality of wearing face masks. And in case they do, they may find out evidence to attest its efficiency as a preventative measure against spreading the coronavirus, but not evidence for its status of being a savior. For this reason, I examined the hashtag Mascara Salva across Twitter in order to identify arguments of conformity to the wearing of the mandatory face masks and to explore them as a transitional object that reshapes the self. I argue that the arguments of conformity may be used as a coping mechanism to deal with one's deep emotions while exceeding their resilience threshold level, which increases their vulnerability to anxiety and depression. So I, for, for this work, I, I use it, a software called uh, TUDA minor so that I could uh, extract uh, the hashtag Mascara Salva from the Twitter. And it was between the period of May 1st and to May 18. And I reached um, a total of 759 Twitter messages. So you can see here on the screen, you know, as, you know, the keyword Mascara Salva, COVID, wear them, and mask and uh, others that are a little bit contextualized here. But uh, um, out of these 759 messages, I sought them out and created categories to organize the data, which were reduced to 260 messages that deal with conformity, non-conformity, and adaptation to the mandatory face masks. And I'll briefly describe the categories. So uh, just for you to have an idea, out of, out of the 759 Twitter messages, Mascara Salva was the most you know, frequent keyword. And then the next one that is stay at home and then would be to use and use the mask and so on. But that would be stay at home. It's another message also that has been spread by government policies and uh, uh, health communities, right? Um, and this is something very difficult for Brazilian people to stay home. So wearing masks and staying home are really very difficult habits for Brazilian people for the mask to follow. So it's changing habits. That's why I was so much interested, right? Knowing the culture, how these would affect them. So. I have then here the 216 Twitter messages, and I have here on the slide the um, classifications, the coding that I have for them. And I have uh, three main ones that's adaptation, conformity, and nonconformity. So um, the first category, the adaptation, as you can see, is divided into human and object. So I called it human because there were messages with tone. Uh, or joke in the Twitter and the or message that attenuated the gravity of the pandemic or to get used to this new object, imposed object, that is the face mask. The object itself, right, refers to the mask as an independent item with its shape, color, texture that people can handle with, wear, and dispose it. The second category that's where I was um, uh, looking more into my work, is the conformity. It's where messages that endorse the Mascara Salva movement, along with the government decisions, the local government decisions that usually go against the president. So enforcing the wearing of face masks, having even fines, punishing people with fines, so if they are in the public space, they have to wear them. So these ma messages, all right, so also hold the position that face mask or the belief that face mask save 
from the coronavirus. And this is the issue because it doesn't save, all right? But the way it has been can be misunderstood as that. If you're aware, you're completely uh, safe and uh, nothing's gonna happen to you. So this is what I was worried about when I was reading those messages. The subcategory consciousness, so under the conforming messages, is to raise public awareness and reinforce the citizens' moral obligations to wear the mask for self-care and care for the others. So in this regard, the next subcategory is self-care and care speak for themselves, very clear. The act of wearing a mask in public is a demonstration of self-care and care for the others. Now, another interesting category is fashion, right? That is a conforming message that recasts the face mask as an accessory that can adorn a person, distancing from its original functionality of prevention and salvation. The next one is preaching. That's a little bit of educating people, but more into the preaching level. That is conforming messages that attempt to educate and convince people, that's why I say preaching, more about convincing people of the need to wear face masks in order to combat the spread of the virus. The next one is public shaming, and that would also go direct against the president's uh, um, behavior. And these criticize people who are not conforming by not wearing the face mask in public areas. The last is conformity category is solidarity. And that's an interesting one as well, because these are messages to congratulate the organizations and municipalities that have been sponsored or has been supporting the campaign and you and you, you'll see example later that you're gonna if you if you know some of this big corporations you'll recognize them and the last category was that i was so interesting and who is not conforming so non-conformity and these are messages that questions whether faith masks can save or in a way showing distrust to the campaign as well so next, I have here then some examples that I'm going to share with you from the Twitter. So you have uh, the Portuguese and the original one and the uh, uh, near translation of that. So adaptation of human and object here. I have, for example, I needed to go out yesterday. Everyone was wearing the mask. A young man carried it by its elastic band. A lady had it hanging on her bag. An old man had his nose out of the mask. Another one worries as an earring. So the most important thing is to wear it correctly. So in a way, it's humor, but it's also criticizing people that this is an object, the mask is an object, but has to be handled properly. So there is a tone, at least for me here, that's a humor, but uh, uh, talking about you know people that you know you have to do it correctly to to prevent yourself to care about your uh, care about yourself and the others so this is one example another example of conformity in I try to give one example that has the many categories together overlapping that's consciousness care self-care solidarity so you can see here the solidarity corporations worldwide corporations that you may even know them and they are also located in Brazil. And the Twitter says here, we are very proud that you are wearing the mask and that you have invited everyone to wear one. To wear a mask is to show self-care and care for the other. So very explicit message here, right? Um, easy to understand these categories. Shaming. Um, this is an interesting one because these are people that conform and then they shame the others that don't, that are not wearing the mask. I have my video covering here, my, uh, my screen. So the laziness of people um, uh, that think that they are too macho to wear a mask. Eh? So a little bit of, uh, in Portuguese, they view just to, you know, in Canada, I try to get, uh, <laughs> But uh, um, it's not a translation issue here, but the question here is that some, and this is talking more about the male population that think they are too macho 
to wear something to protect themselves. So they don't need to be protected because they are men. That's something that we could explore more in questions of gender here, but uh, so far you can get the idea. Preaching. As a mask is not a decoration, mask is not accessory, a mask is not a key ring, a mask is not an object. A mask saves, wear it, and by the way, if you wear it down on the chin, it's better not even to wear it. So what you have here is somebody really screaming <laughs> and shouting and to, you know, preaching. And fashion, so here talks about how beautiful it is, the femininity, and the print so you can see that here trying to sell the mask as something that is going to adorn yourself adorn you and non-conformity is when it's not uh, agreeing with that and somebody said here that according to some um, um, research specialists the mask can destroy the immunologic system and the aftermath of the lockdown, there will be other diseases coming up. So as you can see from here, right, these messages, they have lots to uh, give us lots of things to think about and discuss. So I will now uh, evaluate them in a general way. As seen, to conform uh, with wearing a face mask means to believe in the statement that the masks can save and must be worn in public areas. Thus, conformity here involves beliefs and actions that a group can control. And if you adhere to them, you will become part of the face mask community, receiving the approval and trust, and grant you a certain identity. In other words, you think and act as your neighbors do. The argument of conformity is strongly constructed on the grounds of self-caring and care for the others, the nearest ones, and on the consciousness of saving oneself and the other. Otherwise, you're putting one's life into risk when infected or infecting the others. Wearing a face mask in public space is a symbol that identifies you as a compassionate person who cares for the others, a responsible citizen, and a solidary human being. Although mask or self campaign has its own merit, we should not ignore what lies underneath the argument of conformity. Our deep emotions, that is, our fears, that can lead to anxiety and depression. The presence of a face mask reminds us of infection, sickness, death. Still for others, it can trigger personal traumatic experiences in order to masquerade the mask or give the mask a makeup advertisement of beautiful design homemade mask in vibrant colors, motifs, textures and different sizes for babies, children, youth and adults. And they are widely circulated across the internet. It conforms with fashion, commodity and fetishism. Moreover, as a standalone object, the face mask becomes personified or better, they fight with its power to save humanity as some Twitter messages have shown. The visual rhetoric of Christ the Redeemer statue, the countless cultural icon, Wearing the face mask reinforces the campaign with a religious tone and metaphor. Mask save. Like the savior, the face mask can save us from distress, danger, and loss. From this view, I'm inspired by Winnie Cole's work on object relation and the development of the self. I consider the face mask a transitional object that creates an intermediate area of experience which Winnicott refers as transitional phenomena, with its transitional space. The face mask sets a space between the individual and the environment, that means the other. So the other individuals, in a way, bridging the I in relation to others. The mask creates an intermediate area of experiencing in which an inner reality, experience, a perception by the I, relates to an outer reality, which is perceived by the eye and the eye. As the data shown, some Twitter messages allocate as transitional space, where individuals relate to their insecurities by revealing their dependence on the use of a face mask as a transitional object. Such messages show that they are in denial to their vulnerable condition. And for this reason, they are convinced that a face mask can save themselves 
from either spreading or catching the coronavirus. This becomes a self-defense mechanism for avoiding dealing with others or one's own fears, or better, for avoiding dealing with their own fears and ignoring their emotions. As a transitional object in Winnicott's sense, we assume that the face mask will eventually lose its function once the pandemic is over either by the result of herd community strategy or the creation of a new vaccine. It becomes the stochastic, stochastic similar to a toddler's piece of blanket that loses its meaning to the user. The transitional object conserves an individual's growth and maturation, which leads to the change of the self. So as you can see here, uh, Winnicott, because of time you have already the time to read, Winnicott here, um, a statement in regarding to object relating. So I'm just skipping as you can read it. As a transitional object, the face mask reshapes our sense of self as we establish symbolic and relational meanings while wearing it, which may impact on the way we perceive ourselves and interact with others. In other words, the face mask redefines us, our body and our community. The community understood here as the environment can be considered good enough when it provides the individual with trust and support to their adaptation to a new normal. Wearing the face mask conforms with our adaptation to new rules and to a new context that emerges from a chronic economic, political, and social and environmental crisis that has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So to conclude, under the discourse on precedent and time, new government policies are set without democratic strategies, changing people's routine abruptly. The, this triggers individuals and society's fears, stress and anxiety, as seen in the case of Brazil. People resort to post messages and to follow hashtags such as Mascara Salva as a form of coping mechanism to organize the mess that the new normal has created. As Winnicott states, organized nonsense is a red defense, just as organized chaos is a denial of chaos. The acting of tweeting conforming messages is an attempt to find some sense in the nonsense, to handle the uncertainties, and to navigate through contested discourses that emerge from public health authorities, scientific communities, and government offices. Although we are living through unprecedented time, Human beings are wired to be resilient and capable of adapting to new conditions and environment in order to survive. In other words, human beings and the self are seen as a complex, adaptive and dynamic entity capable of building resilience during a period of crisis. And you have here on the screen Galatze Levy statement about adaptive system live in, uh, on the edge of chaos. So to conclude, the period of relative disorganization is transient, is transient, uh, transitional, as it is the wearing of mandatory face masks and the COVID pandemic. At this moment, we are building our resilience, learning from our fears, and conforming with procedures that we believe can keep us safe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I got my own mask. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. Um, masks uh, here in Germany are not only a fashion piece, but they're also a piece of advertisement. So my company actually put their name on it, so I can do a little bit of adver advertisement for them. Um, okay. That's a great reality. Thank you for <laughs> illustrating it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your, um, for your interesting research. And I'm going to um, remind the attendees again, if you have any questions towards Andrea, you can use the FAQ uh, tool. Um, so if you want to put anything down there, you're more than welcome to do that now. Um, so um, I guess in Canada, you, it, it is mandatory to wear masks, right? Not, not really. Well, this is controversial. This is the point because it's local governments. Okay. This is not mandatory. It's recommended. <laughs> so it becomes up to uh, the person, to the citizen, how conscious they are in wearing the mask. So there's nothing that uh, so far that we would pay a fine if we are not wearing them. So uh, 
some people would do it. And because we are very diverse population here in Toronto, for example, Asian population, you don't need even to ask them to. They start wearing even before the pandemic started because I teach international students, especially coming from Asian countries, and they were all wearing the mask in January at the very beginning of the term. So um, that's why I was interested to know more about the Brazilian habits because I know that for them that would be something that you have to impose or pay a fine to do it. Even here too, there are many people that also, you know, think that they don't need it or and there are campaigns, but not, I think, in the sense that it's mandatory, not at this point. Yeah, well, here it's mandatory on public transport and when you go um, to the supermarket, but not when you're just on the streets, then it's not mandatory. Yes, well, some, some local retailers are asking people to wear because, as I said, the word the recommendation, all right, when, when they use the word recommendation, becomes very dubious. You don't know, like, you cannot force if you're using recommendation. So the word they are using, and this is also the, the problem that I think that these who or uh, any other organization, when they are using recommendations, because actually they cannot make it mandatory because they also say that you have to take into account the country's context. You, you're not gonna put something mandatory if in the country doesn't need that. So it becomes up to local governments or countries to establish their own measures and their own uh, policies. And that's why I think it becomes controversial. Yeah, <laughs> because, but when you, you know, go, when you go on the streets, you can see the um, majority in Toronto on the streets, you can see the majority wearing them or not. Mm, not well, if you're under public transportation, I think people are more aware of that. If you go to retail your stores, like big ones, I've seen that. Um, but on the streets, on the parks, you, and depends, you know, uh, how busy the place is. Um, in Brazil, as far as I know, because I also fa have family there, to go to the grocery is mandatory. And it seems that some grocers give a mask to people. That's what I know from some people who are living there. They receive a mask at the, at the door. So. Yeah. But yes. it's not always uh, easy to have access to a mask. No. Yeah. Yes. Um, the disposable ones, all right? They are giving disposable ones. And uh, I also know from local people there, because I'm from Rio, and, you know, Rio is also a, is, is big as Sao Paulo, but Sao Paulo is bigger, but we also have lots of very difficult uh, situations there in terms of um, um, the communities the underprivileged communities, and they are very afraid of that, and they are making them at home. So they have homemade in, uh, around the community. I know uh, from people that live in there and telling me, so giving you the data from <laughs> informants that are living there at the moment. So their own communities organize themselves, and these are low class communities, and they are organizing themselves to Pre, uh, to create this homemade mask. But then becomes the issue, all right? What about the safety protocols? What about the material they are, wear, uh, they are using? And I don't think they have the knowledge or even the knowledge and also the conditions, affordability to buy, you know, quality material. So then becomes also other questions behind it. It's a good movement that people are conscious about that, but at the same time, we are also aware of the difficulties that they are facing due to poverty, due to uh, political crisis going on, economic crisis going on. So it's really very difficult for them right now. Yeah, I find it very interesting, the contrast between wearing a mask as a symbol, um, not only to actually um, prevent um, the virus from spreading, but as a symbol that you're um, well, as a symbol for solidarity, but also people wearing the mask and be like, okay, we're wearing, wearing masks now, now we can come close again. So there's this kind of difficulty when it comes to that, um, with it being a positive symbol and the kind of negative symbol at the same time. Um, so I think yes, it's interesting. exactly. They are trying to launch the mask as something, as a piece of argument. So to, you know, as a fashion, 
So with different uh, um, colors, different textures, and different sizes. But the thing is that, yes, they think they, the, the problem with this is the messages say, mascara saves, the mascara, the mask saves, right? So the mascara solver means that, well, I can wear that, so nothing's gonna happen to me. This is what it's um, something that we should be cautious about, that wearing the mask is not that's gonna save you, it's gonna protect you. And that's where I think it is uh, the question of in this presentation as well, right? And the connotation that wearing, they put, uh, you know, the Christ the Redeemer with the mask, so giving this religious tone as well, that's saving. So can create false um, ideas about the mask. Yeah. Um, I cannot see any questions right now. Um, so to the audience, if you have any questions, please shoot them out now. Um, otherwise, I would say thank you so much for your research, Andrea. Um, I was really enjoying your talk. And then I would ask Erin and Fiona. Yeah. I will, I can introduce them because we thought we would introduce. Okay, so yes, um, now we are gonna have our next presenters here. I have uh, from Canada, also my colleagues here from Canada, they are in the east side of Canada, <laughs> I'm in Toronto. So I have here Fiona, Miss Fiona J. Cunningham, and she has a master in education. Um, she earned her Bachelor of Science at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, Canada, and her Master of Education at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And she's currently her first year of clinical psychology PhD studies at Fielding Graduate University, where she earned a certificate in clinical psychology in 2017. She teaches professionally with the Master in Counseling Psychology program at the Memorial University of Newfoundland and has worked with women's mental health issues in Newfoundland over the past 20 years, demonstrates a particular passion for perinatal health and supporting survivors of domestic violence. She currently lives in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. And I have as a co-presenter here, uh, Ms. Erin Cameron, and she completed undergraduate and postgraduate studies at Asbury, I think Asbury University and the University of Edinburgh. She's currently a clinical psychology doctoral student at Fielding Graduate University. Her research focuses on trauma and inequality and the resulting consequence in the areas of human rights, women's health, human trafficking, and climate change. She's also actively involved in global humanitarian re relief work with trusting populations and is a member of the International Council of Psychologists. So I'm very glad now to have this panel, the last one with these two presenters with an interesting background and experience that's going to share here with us their work today. You can go ahead. <clears throat> thank you for having us here today and thank you Andrea for the introductions. And thank you everyone for hanging on to the end um, of this panel to hear our presentation. The title of our talk is Indicators of Climate Change and Structural Inequality Predict Estimated Modern Slavery Cases Across Countries. The preamble to, unite, to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is a foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. Climate crisis is a term used to describe global warming, climate change, and their consequences. And according to the United Nations, climate change is possibly the defining issue of our time. In 2017, disasters displaced 18.8 million people in 135 countries. More than 2 billion people lack access to safe drinking water, sanitation, and hygiene. Around 5 million people die prematurely every year due to air pollution, 
accounting for approximately one in every 10 deaths annually. 75% of the world's poor are affected by forest degradation and deforestation. Water and sanitation related diseases remain among the major causes of death in children under the age of five. 800 million people globally are undernourished and by 2050, that number is expected to increase by an additional 2 billion people. In this graphic, it outlines a conceptual framework that delineates the many ways and the many that climate change has influenced health risks among humans. Perhaps one of the greatest consequences of climate change, however, has been forced migration. Our past research has shown that migration is a significant predictor of estimated prevalence of modern slavery. And climate change is a driver of modern, of a driver of migration, with nearly 19 million people displaced globally in 2017. Trafficking in persons, according to the United Nations, is the acquisition of people by improper means, such as force, fraud, or deception, with the aim of exploiting them. Trafficking in persons, human trafficking, and modern slavery are used as umbrella terms to refer to sex trafficking, forced organ donation, forced marriage, and all forms of compelled labor. Despite the existence of national and international treaties, policies, and laws, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Human trafficking remains a significant human rights crisis. Currently, human trafficking is the third most prevalent crime worldwide. There are 40.3 million estimated victims of human trafficking. The majority of overall victims are female. 96% of victims that are trafficked for sexual exploitation are female. Fiona, you're muted. Thank you. Psychological effects of direct exposure to traumatic stressors is well documented. The crises might stem from natural disaster, man-made disaster, the current pandemic we're currently in, or any type of interpersonal violence. But the psychological responses by the system in the body are all similar. It should also be noted that when we're talking about climate change, the distinction between natural and man-made disaster may start to blur. We may see psychological effects in a number of ways, including emotional, cognitive, physical, and behavioral effects. Emotional effects include things such as grief, anger, and hopelessness. Cognitive effects are things such as denial, impaired concentration, impaired memory, difficulty making decisions, and suicidal ideation. Physical effects include trouble sleeping, whether too much or not enough, tiredness, loss of appetite, and hyperarousal. Behavioral changes include increased substance use as consequences of the other side effects. And all these effects may manifest, manifest into mental health concerns such as PTSD, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicidal ideation or behaviors, or put a person at risk of developing other physical illnesses as a result of the trauma and stress. In addition to the above mentioned consequences of stress and trauma, victims of human trafficking can also face additional specific psychological consequences. CPTSD or complex post-traumatic stress disorder can occur after prolonged repeated experiences of interpersonal trauma, specifically in a context in which the individual has little or no chance of escape. CPTSD symptoms can include disturbance in affect regulation, dissociation, struggles with self-concept, and interpersonal so struggles with self-concept and interpersonal relationships, and somaticization. Victim, victims can also go on to de develop fugue states 
and dissociative identity disorder in some cases of extreme trauma, including human trafficking. There are also relational consequences of human trafficking due to the internalization of the activities involved and the coercion implicit in the victimization. Shame and mistrust in relationships may be experienced along with a lingering traumatic bonding. There is a stigma around the involvement of being a victim of human trafficking that is enforced by legal systems that criminalize prostitution, as well as health outcomes such as HIV AIDS status or addictions. It's important to note that risk factors to PTSD include being female, having lower education level and poor mental health, all of which we see in a population of victims of human trafficking. So the rationale for our study, recent studies indicated that women are disproportionately vulnerable to both human trafficking and the negative consequences of climate change, which are intensified under inequitable social conditions. So we conducted this study to identify which specific indicators of climate change and structural inequality are associated with a higher vulnerability to modern slavery. The predictors were taken from archival data sets from the United Nations Development Program, from the World Health Organization, the Global Slavery Index, and the EPI, the Environmental Performance Index. Predictors of structural inequality were chosen based on a human rights framework informed by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which have already been mentioned in this panel. The predictors uh, for structural inequality are in the left-hand column of this slide, and the predictors representing aspects of climate change in the right-hand column. The Environmental Performance Index is a method of quantifying and numerically marking the environmental performance of a state's policies. This is designed to supplement the environmental targets set forth in, in the United Nations 2015 Sustainable Development Goals, often referred to as the SDGs, and also the Paris Climate Agreement. We used the 2018 EPI scores, which covered 180 countries on 24 performance indicators across 10 issue categories covering environmental health and ecosystem vitality. And you can see here in our graphic that the middle ring of the circle, of the colored circles, we used um, the, the issue categories of air quality, water and sanitation, heavy metals, agriculture, water resources, air pollution, climate and energy, fisheries, forests, biodiversity, and habitat. You can see in the outer ring of this graphic what each of those 10 issue categories entailed specifically. Our dependent variable, as Fiona mentioned, was the estimated prevalence of modern slavery victims. Our full model was significant upon multiple regression analysis, and our full model explained 40% of the variance in estimated prevalence of modern slavery victims across countries. If we look at the individual beta values for our full model, the beta values show the relationships between variables and it compares the strength of effect of each individual predictor and the dependent variable. The strongest beta values of the climate change predict predictors, as you can see here, was loss to forest cover at 0.41 and agriculture 0.19. They were both positively correlated with modern trafficking as we predicted. The strongest beta values for the inequality predictors were the share of seats in parliament for women, women over the age of 25 who have secondary education, and years of schooling for females, all of which were negatively correlated with human trafficking, which also fits our hypotheses. To highlight one of the strongest predictors in this full model, forests, approximately 1.6 billion people worldwide are reliant on forest ecosystems as their source of income and approximately 300 million people live in forests, including 60 million indigenous peoples. We found our strongest effect size to be in our final model, which explained 45% of the variance in our criterion variable. The best predictors, as you can see here, were agriculture, share of seats in parliament for women, years of schooling for women over the age of 25, and forests, which again, forests, we specifically looked at tree cover loss. 
As you can see here with our correlations table, a number of variables are correlated with each other, such as education of women and girls is associated with water resources and increased income. However, education is not as highly correlated with the share of seats in Parliament for women, perhaps indicating cultural factors that we have not examined here. These important findings suggest that environmental stressors such as climate change likely exacerbate structural social inequalities and may increase women's vulnerability to modern slavery. Specific predictors play a larger role than others, such as air quality, agriculture, and heavy metal exposure. And when examined together with indicators of inequality, such as share of seats in parliament for women and women over 25 with secondary education, they speak directly to our hypotheses. Awareness of the unique relationship between climate change, gender inequality, and modern slavery provides a meaningful contribution to our understanding of factors driving human exploitation and provides an empirical foundation for recommendations and interventions to ameliorate the causes and consequences of climate change and human trafficking that are associated with human suffering. And again, to highlight one of our strongest predictors in our conclusion, unsustainable agricultural practices are one of the most significant causes of food scarcity globally. According to the United Nations, almost 800 million people globally are undernourished. And by 2050, that number is expected to increase by an additional 2 billion people. We argue that strict anti-trafficking policies have not been sufficient to, the, to combat the egregious human rights crisis that is modern slavery, which is in alignment with our past research, which showed that laws and anti-trafficking policies are insufficient to the cause. Additionally, current climate agreements have been insufficient to the climate crisis. Examining such a broad range of key factors allows for an expanded approach to change and it presents more areas for intervention. We recommend um, intervention in the areas of climate policy, structural equality, public health action, training of healthcare professionals, and we also call for a gender analysis of all of these areas. Public health action should include targeted and culturally appropriate interventions and novel technologies and solutions to prevent and control emerging physical and mental health threats associated with the interaction between climate change, structural inequality, and human trafficking. Additionally, public health interventions need to target the needs of climate refugees, especially during migration, in order to minimize the associated risks, such as vulnerability to human trafficking. Training of all healthcare professionals is needed to provide appropriate physical and mental health care, such as prevention, screening, and treatment for victims of climate change and human trafficking. Assessment and interventions need to encompass chronic conditions, mental health, and trauma due to the effects of climate change, such as migration, job loss, disease, forced displacement, separation from loved ones, and of course, we've mentioned human trafficking. Policies and inactions that are in alignment with the SDG goals are needed for structural equality and climate change that address these issues as well as specific predictors in our model. We call for a gender analysis of climate change to address both the climate crisis and structural inequality that predominantly affects women. Women are disproportionately affected by the effects of climate change and human trafficking, so we need to look at recommendations and conclusions with the gender framework. So to elaborate a little on how that should look when we consider these uh, climate change factors to a gender framework. Some examples would be the following. Air quality, because in order to improve public health and well-being, we need access to clean and affordable energy, especially for women and children in developing regions. Globally, almost 3 billion people continue to depend on solid fuels for cooking and heating, and 90% of rural sub-Saharan African population and 75% of the rural population in China and India are included in this. Women and children experience the highest exposure levels from household air pollution due to customary household rules. Women and children in developing countries are most affected by unsafe management of human waste as well. Water and sanitation related diseases remain among the major causes of 
of death globally in children under five years of age. Women and children in many countries bear responsibility for managing household water supply, sanitation, and health. This includes collecting water, which is time consuming, difficult, and sometimes a dangerous task for women and girls. These responsibilities can compromise school participation, health and disease management, and other components of a safe, productive, and healthy life. During pregnancy, lead stored in the maternal bone can mobilize into the bloodstream and lead can be transferred from mother to child. In addition, high levels of lead can cause miscarriage, premature birth, and fetal malformations. The drivers of human trafficking are complex. While past research has indicated that drivers include political, economic, social, structural, cultural, psychological, and personal factors, yet no model has successfully explained the increasing and ongoing egregious global human rights crisis that is human trafficking. We posit that any model that attempts to explain this human rights crisis of human trafficking should include the indicators of climate change. Thank you for um, your time today. And if you scan the QR code, you can have access to our reference page and our contact information is here on the left if you have any further questions. Thank you so much, Erin and Fiona, for your uh, research and for your talk on your research. Found it very interesting, some very shocking numbers that I wasn't really aware of. Um, so uh, maybe I missed that, but um, I would really like to, to know more about um, the, the background of your research and how you came up um, with your hypotheses and how you um, like why you wanted to investigate in that topic, that would be very interesting for me. And we have been doing um, research in human trafficking across, across several domains for the past few years. We started with structural inequality, um, looking at the, the um, fact that women have an increased vulnerability to trafficking. And that led us to other factors such as women's health and the lack of women's health and all of that led us to um, looking at migration and immigration. Um, and our research has shown that immigration is a huge predictor of a woman's vulnerability to be trafficked um, into all types of modern slavery. And then we started looking at the drivers of migration. What is driving migration? And with nearly 20 you know, million people displaced worldwide due to disasters just in 2017 alone, um, many of those disasters were driven by um, climate change. Yeah, it was very, um, I kind of um, got a bit emotional during your talk because, um, uh, yeah, because of the, the topic itself, obviously. Um, I just wanted to remind the attendees, if you guys have any questions um, for Erin and Fiona, that you can use the FAQ tool, uh, FAQ, uh, tool in, in the toolbar down below. Um, uh, yeah, again, thank you so much, guys, for your research. I know that um, my timekeeping wasn't that great today, so I wanted to apologize again for that. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I will make sure that um, in the future that, does, that it doesn't happen anymore. Um, so, yeah, if you guys have any more questions um, for Fiona and Erin, but I can't see any right now. We're just going to wait for a little bit longer, maybe someone because they come up when I um, usually when I say um, we're gonna finish now then all the questions are popping up so I'm just gonna wait for a few moments um, yeah but I can't see anything popping up now so maybe everyone else wants to come on stage again all the other panelists if they're still there don't know if they're still there. <laughs> Hi, Andrea. Hi, Gabe. <laughs> Maybe Evelyn is not here with us. But yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. It was um, very interesting um, for me um, as a student. Um, I, as a student in the beginning of my psychology, um, my psychology career, it's very interesting to hear so many different topics 
um, and then especially in those times where I feel, well, a lot of us feel um, a little bit disconnected. It's very nice to connect with you guys from all over the world. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your, for your thoughts today. And yeah, do you have any last words that you want to say? Thank you for inviting us to give our talk. No worries. Oh, there's Evelyn. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I'd um, like to say thank you for meeting you all. It was a great pleasure to meet you. I, you know, for the organization, I wouldn't be able to meet you all and know what your work, the incredible works that have been done. And I hope that we, we keep connected, right? Wish you all well, everybody stay healthy, stay safe. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, then I would end this panel now. Um, you guys are more than welcome to join the crisis talk um, in half an hour. So I think this is going to be the last session for the conference. So that's a bit exciting. Um, other than that, I wish you all a um, very pleasant day. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy in those times. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.